Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the open table, tavola aperta. Uh, bonjour à tous les mots et benvenuti à tutti. Um, today, our guest is uh, Michele Ciasofera. He's exhibiting here his uh, artwork, Yana's uh, uh, Code, at the Pavilion of Tradition. We have uh, also our curator, Christine Marcel. So, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, the open table uh, is intended as an informal lunch uh, with the artist, a, a talk and a lunch, so don't hesitate to talk and to do questions to Michele and even to eat a little bit because we must eat something. Um, uh, we were talking about uh, the language of our speech, so uh, if possible we are going to to do the, the talk in English uh, for uh, archival purposes uh, so that uh, everybody is allowed to understand. But of course, if you want to do any question in uh, French uh, or Italian, Michele will be absolutely able to answer in both the languages. Uh, so let's start from um, the exhibition and the artwork you are exhibiting here, Yana's Code, how it, it started uh, and uh, if you if Christine Marcel uh, wanted that piece for the exhibition or you, it, it was you, your choice. So, hi to everybody. Basically, uh, the, this work is the result uh, of my entire life because I was born in, S in Sardinia in 1969, but raised in Sicily. And uh, in my travels all along my life until today between Sardinia and uh, in Sicily. I was always dreaming of Sardinia when I was in Sicily and always dreaming of Sicily when I was in Sardinia. So in my mind I always try to create bridges through heart and uh, this, this work is also a result of, that, uh, of this link uh, bit through memory because the work speaks about uh, archaeological site in Sardinia called Domus de Llanas which are uh, Neolithic graves carved in the rock uh, from 4,000 years ago. And uh, that they are linked to popular legend, uh, and mostly the most the Yanas. Yanas means fairy. And uh, the story tells about a god that was taking a rest in Sardinia, and it was formed uh, some bees, because he was also a bee, bee keeper transformed some bees in small women, trying uh, to uh, connect them uh, with the future world, which was the world of human beings. During that time, so the waiting, those small women, the fairy, were developing textile practice and uh, creative practice. So Sardinia is like uh, a female world until today. And uh, I was always observing this world to the legends, but uh, even also to the tales of my mother, my grandmother, and uh, everybody in my family. So when Christine was uh, projecting the exhibition and she asked to me about uh, developing this work uh, that uh, was on the way, according to, to her process and uh, to her idea, it fitted really well with the Pavilion of Tradition and uh, I think that uh, this work tells uh, a lot of tradition, of memory, but also of uh, shamanism, for example, because Sardinia is um, an, uh, a cryptic micro microcosmo, which is totally different, for example, from the other island where I used to live or the place where I, I live now, which is Paris, because Sardinia, even if they are in the middle of the Mediterranean, they had different domination and different cultures until today um, from Sicily, from the rest of Italy and from the rest of the countries in the Mediterranean. Speaking about uh, the um, archaeological site, for example, some of the areas where I've been uh, living, uh, Sicily or uh, when I was traveling in Malta or in Spain, for example, host uh, some kind of similar and of same age graves but as, for example, in Pantalica or Castelluccio in Sicily, but Malta is the same. But none of them uh, as uh, like popular legend as the Sardinian one uh, I was telling. And, uh, and also the structure is a bit different because as I was telling, those graves are carved in the rock 
but those people used to furnish the, the graves mm -hmm. uh, with um, tables uh, or chairs made by stone, which is completely different from the rest of similar archaeological sites in the Mediterranean. And that means that uh, those people believe uh, in the trespassing between life and death, uh, like a circular process, in which uh, that, the moment of death was just one night, and um, people that were passing this line, passing through this line, uh, has to find, uh, like, uh, commodities and uh, um, a livable place inside the rocks uh, connecting to the cosmos and to nature, which was one of the main uh, essence of this place. Because, for example, inside uh, uh, the caverns, inside the, the, the graves, there are uh, kind of graffiti or uh, depiction figures or signs which are totally related with the idea of Cosmo, which is topic in uh, one of the topics in Sardinian culture. And you mentioned lots of time uh, the word Mediterranean because it's quite important in, in your practice, but even in your background. Uh, and I was thinking about even the artist practice video, that's your artist practice video that starts with uh, water, so maybe yeah. a sea, maybe... And, uh, and you mentioned, even in your actress practice video, the importance of the, the Mediterranean Sea and the tradition, uh, the melting pot that was the Mediterranean Sea in the past, but even nowadays. So referring even to the one, uh, another exhibition that you did uh, in, uh, in Palermo at Museo Palazzo Riso, uh, shall you maybe go a little bit further in, the, in this yes. topic? Yes, thank you. Mediterranean is... One of my main topics, as, as I told you, I've been living between Sardinia and Sicily for a while, for a long time. And um, I studied, my background is political science and anthropology and sociology. So Mediterranean is like uh, a perfect area where to discover how migration, for example, but uh, even culture has been developing uh, through centuries, and uh, this melting pot uh, was really the richness of the sea and all the countries facing to the sea. So some years ago, I wrote a project about um, a kind of connection between the different culture facing in the Mediterranean in contemporary, in contemporary time, in even, all, of course, in art. And uh, this project had place in Palermo in five different venue, historical venues, uh, from the 7th century until uh, the 16th century, because, for example, one of the places where the exhibition was hosted was a, um, a Muslim mosque transformed by Sicilian in a church where a Sicilian emperor has been crowned in, during the 13th and 14th century. That's just to say that uh, Sicily is a perfect melting pot to do that. Uh, and uh, when I was thinking to this project, uh, I was dreaming to make it in Palermo and even in Syracuse, that are the two main cities where I've been living in Sicily for uh, almost 20, 25 years, because they are really connected with uh, a world which is mostly almost the classic and the Greek world that is coming up again right now very hardly even with the troubles due to immigration because there, there are big polemics and uh, big conflict right now to this on, up on the subject uh, but uh, I think that uh, we have to reflect again how this kind of migration could be richness for our life and for our culture and I really think that uh, this condition is the only possibility for like, a future in the Mediterranean. And uh, art and culture could make a bridge between uh, the different aspects of politics and society. Thank you. And uh, so in my mind, I've been always, I, I was telling before that uh, in my travel, during my youthness between Sicily and Sardinia, 
due to some family aspect, uh, and uh, I was always dreaming to make bridges, to make uh, kind of wires that could connect uh, those two so different cultures. Because when I was when I was young and uh, was taking a, a plane, for example, to go to from Palermo to Cagliari or back, I was always reflecting how the landscape uh, is different. Uh, how the culture is different. In Sardinia, there are no temples. In Sicily, everything could be discovered very easily because everything is up on the ground. Sardinia is everything is need to be discovered and uh, need to be told. Even if uh, Sardinian culture is the culture of silence, Sicilian culture is the culture of speaking, which is exactly the opposite. So I was always trying to connect and to bridge the, these two different dimensions. And about the Mediterranean, I was thinking even about uh, your, uh, I can't say last, but one of your last uh, uh, works, uh, uh, the one presented at the Documenta, uh, which is quite different from the one presented here. So uh, you use another media and yeah. uh, you are going to, to do it again. And so shall you, shall you talk about even uh, the density of the transparent wind is yeah, exactly. the correct title? Exactly. So this is a right example of my life because at the same time that I was working for the Venice exhibition with the work speaking about Sardinia, uh, about this microcosmo, I was also working on another media, using another media on another work the density of the transparent wind uh, for the other exhibition, which is a sound work, a 39 minutes recorded sound work that has been recorded uh, on, on, a, on, a on a fisherman boat that used to cross the Mediterranean between uh, Syracuse, Malta, and, Libyan, and Lib the Libyan Sea. And so sharing life with those people that uh, I knew during my time, my lifetime in Syracuse, was another expression of, of life, because I always think that uh, art is an expression of life. We never disconnect art from life, in my opinion. Even, e even if poetry or imagination or fantasy could create uh, like uh, a supplementary dimension in doing that, but uh, working on the sound work of Documenta, I was always trying to make the bridge between, at the same time, <laughs> between uh, those two exhibitions, those two countries, those two islands, those two cultures. And one was just telling of contemporary life of fishermen, which is um, in danger because fishing and fishermen, uh, due to the effect of European law, mostly for small fishermen, is going to be completely disconnected uh, from the economy, from the market, the and those market. people yeah. are really suffering. So their job is, is kind of medic job to me. Their life is medic, and um, I respect them. And they've been mm. collaborating doing mm. the record of this piece, and we have been discussing a lot uh, before, during, and we will continue discussing after because I'm ready to fight for them. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I was, um, yes, thinking about uh, your, your artwork here, but uh, the, the practice in general. So in some interview and some books, I read that you, you are a collectionist, a collectionist, and uh, that you use uh, sometimes fossils or stones uh, as ready-made in your artwork, but as keys to reinterpret some <coughs> memories or, tra or, or the artwork itself. So can you talk about yeah. uh, a little bit sure. your practice uh, in this sure. way? So collecting is, has been one of the, uh, the platform from how I was developing my work for Venice. And uh, I started collecting ceramic, fossils, and uh, other different objects when I was 16. And I'm still collecting that. So Sicily was like um, 
a very fertile field to do that because you can even discover everywhere in the, in the ground fragments of, of archaeology, fragments of life, and uh, which are like big discovery to me because they gave me the possibility to fantasize, to imagine how those people were living and how this culture is being transmitted to us. Some years ago, I was working on another cycle of works called Enchanted Nature Revised. And uh, I was discussing with um, a very close friend of mine that disappeared some years ago, was the famous anthropologist Nino Butita, and uh, about uh, the art of collecting. And uh, I was always trying to make new life for these fossils. I was always trying to make new life for ceramics or for old practice. I just want to tell you something uh, about the Neolithic culture. Neolithic culture was topic for human beings' life because they introduced the use of ceramic, the use of metals, the use of stones, but even some social practice as the transmission between different tribute or different human beings. So it was like uh, a big progress for the time. And uh, today I'm still using ceramic, even for example, for some of the objects like up on, laying up on the tables. And that's a gift from this time. So right now we can uh, develop new media, for example. But according to the past, uh, we can develop uh, like a different aspect. It, you, the, the use of sensibility in working in art is also that, uh, not just using the, the media which is given to us, but also making some kind of confrontation with the past uh, and also trying uh, to push it up on the future. Yes, it's... And so the use of the fossil, so for example, I create some boxes or some book with real fossils or some books with fake fossils. When I was working to this series called Enchanted Nature Revised, I was reading books from, um, and mostly the transcription of the conversation between uh, Carl Gustav Jung and uh, the scientist Wolf van Pauli that uh, has been driven along 25 years, in which they were theorizing the fact that uh, archety archetypal memory always come to, to the collective memory. So in, uh, even in modern and contemporary process, uh, people could experience uh, of some archaic memory that was not part of their own life, uh, but uh, always come up. So fossils were like a symbol of that to me. And um, this was a language. So I used fossils as, as a medium, as I used to, to expose objects from my collection to give them new life. To actualize a, a little bit. Yeah, to bit actualize them. them, yeah. Because memory, I think that memory is is still alive if we can actualize that. In Sardinia, for example, the, the transmission of memory through popular legend is normally a, a female process which is made using textile and tapestry, for example. And uh, that's why I was so fascinated by the popular legend of Damus de Llanas, because the idea of people that are still working for centuries or uh, more than centuries on tapestry or on an art medium as today is, is so interesting to me because we can always use like uh, very simple object or very simple medium or with very simple human hack to, to make art. Joseph Boyce was a master in doing that. Yeah. Michele? Michele? Can you tell us what is your uh, daily practice as an artist? Yeah. Your daily life? Your yeah. daily work? <laughs> Since I was four years old, I've been drawing every day until today.
drawing or just sketching or uh, making watercolors. And um, I started making drawing just before learning to learning how to write. So it was much more important to me doing that. Uh, and I never stopped. There are no, no holidays, no vacancies in, my, in this practice which is like uh, the basis is the is fundamental is like uh, the main stone in building this this practice even the works the works i'm exhibiting here are based on uh, sketches and drawing that i used to make uh, so for example before modeling clay before firing ceramic and uh, and all the rest even the, the tapestry, the carpets, belongs from, from drawings. Uh, just a question about this work in, the, in this exhibition. The, from your description, I see mm, most of the Sardinian influence, but I, I'm not able to see the Sicilian side of this mm. work. Okay. Maybe there is a no, 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 no. You are right. There's in this work something has been made in Umbria as the ceramic, the carpets, or the iron and wool sculptures has been made in Sardinia. But for example, the tables, the nine tables, where the objects. Uh, are displayed are all Sicilian tables. They are, I made this choice expressly because they are nine. And nine is one of the, is a number of the universality of the infinite. And uh, all tables, I used to consider them as memory recorder. They are the link, like a real link to memory, because all the time I was telling about uh, my obsession in collection, in collecting objects. And um, walking around and driving around Sicily, okay, I've fine. always been <laughs> facing with old tables, for example, which uh, is uh, an important significance for me, because people have been living there, have been eating there, have been studying, working. And uh, so I was keeping this, trying to keep this memory and trying to save this memory and to connect it to my daily practice, to my art practice. So in doing that, uh, I've always to thanks, uh, so for example, uh, small Langustin that uh, began uh, 44, million years ago, trilobites. I have to thank people that have been doing those tables and living on those tables, because it, this gave me sensation and, uh, and mostly like building my experience uh, to continue my practice, my heart. This, this is a real <laughs> link with Sicily. <laughs> <laughs> to understand if it was just the background or uh, is a, you know, is a, uh, a real part of the exhibition? No, there's, a, there's a real part and okay. I've been, I've been uh, so to, to, to find those tables, I've been uh, like exploring some uh, villages up on the mountains near Syracuse, the Blay Mountains, <laughs> and uh, all those tables belong uh, from the same farm. So. I tried to, to preserve them uh, as uh, just Unit. one history, just one tale. And but you used, uh, l you already used the tables in some of your, uh, yeah. not the same tables, not of the course. Same. Not the same, yeah. And you are going to use it yeah. again. The, 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 you, you told me before those that are Those are part of this work, yeah. but uh, generally, so for example, I'm now making new works yeah. with uh, old not all, not so old, but uh, uh, used school tables, school desks. 
And uh, because conceptually, school desks are different from, from those. And uh, I'm, in this case, I'm trying to connect to childhood. And I was Sorry. thinking about another works that you made that you use uh, ancient, uh, yeah. I think, Sicilian tables. So yeah, always. yeah. It, it was in a, in a 14th century yeah. building in, um, in Siracusa, Siracusa, Palazzo Montalto, uh, four or five years ago. And uh, the, the title of the exhibition was uh, Odio Indifferenti ed Indifferent, because it belongs from both from Sardinia and, uh, and from my political credo. And, uh, and from Antonio Gramsci, one of the Antonio Gramsci most important affirmation, because Gramsci, uh, he was, he told that uh, culture generally is uh, like a, a very important machine uh, against uh, indifference, and indifference uh, is the worst machine uh, against history and life. So in this case, in this old building, uh, it's Gothic building. In the, in the main room, I've been exhibiting five tables with the uh, same kind of different object, objects, but making a completely different language from, uh, this, from one, yeah. this one. And uh, there were uh, so m many, many drawings displayed on the, up on the, on the walls between the arches. Okay. I would like to ask you if there is mm, like a connection between the fact that young people are not using anymore um, the ability to do something by their hands, like sewing, painting, or just drawing or creating something. And because this is very, I think, related to the tradition and everything. And I think they, the, the young people are losing this ability. And what do you think about it? <laughs> I'm just side interested in, um, in tradition, and, but I'm always, uh, I, I told about um, my background in anthropology, and uh, I think that uh, Human life is a, is a process, it's like a circular process, it's like a fluid. And so we can discover technology gives us the possibility to discover new media, new way of uh, expression or almost new way of uh, making life more simple. But uh, technology doesn't mean to forget what uh, what is our background and uh, what we are still able to do. I was, when I was traveling some years ago, like four years ago in, in New York City, I was visiting some exhibition in some gallery in Chelsea. And uh, I was quietly surprised, but um, positively surprised about the fact that uh, very young artists are now working again on uh, art crafts practice, art practice, and uh, I have to remind always what uh, my master, Giovanni Antonio Sulas, which was uh, an artist, but mostly an architect, uh, uh, told me that uh, the basis of our expression is uh, science and almost the drawings. And uh, when I discussed it with uh, Nino Buttita, the anthropologist I was telling you about before, he told me that uh, understanding languages that we know is not so interesting. The more interesting factor uh, is trying to be connected uh, to understand uh, what we are not able to, to read or to write or to really understand. That's uh, the most important in our life. And uh, even in real life, uh, we have, I think that, uh, so for example, for the migrants' condition, I think that is really important today to rediscover how we can uh, understand uh, the richness and the importance uh, of mixing cultures as people like uh, thousands of years ago did before us, better than us, seven times better than us.
Pellegrini buonissimo. <laughs> Sorry, just something. Uh, you know, in the history of human, uh, you know, connecting with your uh, background as an anthropologist, uh, you know, in the history of human being, this the opposition between, uh, you know, the finger, the uh, polish, uh, and the other fingers, fingers is, you know, the most important things. And uh, is uh, exactly, uh, you know, coming from the ground when we were still hominids and uh, we went uh, in becoming uh, Homo erectus yeah. is exactly in parallel with the use of the ends. So um, I think that uh, it's necessary to sometimes to develop our in intelligence, intellectual abilities to use the ends and to work with the ends because only virtual and uh, uh, is, n is not um, uh, let us uh, uh, develop our possibility as um, uh, connecting, uh, you know, the uh, associative uh, area. Yes, our brain. Uh, and so now, you know, I don't want to say that the culture is just going to be different or just digital or uh, uh, people will lose uh, their abilities, intellectual abilities. But I think that that's, in, especially in the artist practice, is really important to do something with the ends. I agree with you. And uh, I have to say that uh, all the senses are very important. Uh, I was telling before about uh, the sound work uh, exhibited in Documenta. And this was just just sound, but uh, I tried to make uh, this work uh, like a real experience, starting from uh, a recording microphone with uh, several sensors to have a, a round sound. Because when you hear uh, this piece, you need absolutely to feel yourself as you are in a boat with those people. Yeah. At the same time, the use of fingers, the use of tactile, is topic not just for our hand or for our eyes, but mostly it belongs from our brain. And um, food, for example, is something that um, I found really interesting. Uh, and uh, making food, for example, is an experience of art to me. And uh, Several years ago, I was traveling uh, several times through Morocco. And um, in South region of Morocco, uh, there were people just eating with ants. They always have forks and uh, a knife, but they prefer to use ants to eat. So I was experiencing with them how taking food just with ants is better than using forks. And uh, that's because of our brain. Of course, th the fingers are the, like, the imposition. The imposition, yeah. <laughs> but the most important is from the brain. And uh, I really agree with you about that. So even touching the artwork, to me, is always possible. I never, I never stop at people touching the artwork <laughs> of mine. <laughs> Michele, what are your political influences? Can b you be specific? <laughs> <laughs> now that you are living in, in Paris and you are not voting maybe in Italy, you can be. <laughs> I'm, I live in Paris and so I, uh, Italian, I'm part of the uh, Italian electoral system, but um, I'm, I'm an abstentionist. And uh, I hope to be an abstentionist for the rest of my life because I don't like politics generally. And uh, as I was telling about, I uh, have my own idea, and uh, I was telling about Antonio Gramsci, which is a very classic uh, way of conceiving uh, for me, like uh, the f even the future for our politics. 
I've been an activist uh, when, I, when I was young, uh, and uh, I don't want to be activist anymore, but I'm always trying uh, in discussing and to know how people uh, can conceive the society, and so conceiving society is always politic, and uh, even art is always politic. And um, I think that uh, I'm mostly interested in knowing and discussing with people that have di completely different or opposite way of thinking than mine, than people that uh, agree with me. And uh, that's why, for example, I have a very close friend uh, from extreme right uh, and uh, several friends from several anarchist friend. And uh, even if my political idea, I think that uh, are just bullshit. We know there is the, that your work is very like deep in the themes and everything, but Simona wanted to ask if there was a, a funny part during the making of, the, of your work. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. The works I so the ceramic uh, I made uh, for the Venice Biennale has been uh, craft and make uh, made in uh, in Umbria in a factory called Cotto Etrusco, which is uh, considered as one of the best Italian manufacturer. It, they use a very modern technology um, to reuse the old tradition of Umbrian ceramic. And uh, people from this factory, I, I was working on, on that in 2016, uh, September 2016, during the fellowship at Civitella Ranieri, which is a, a middle-aged castle in the heart of Umbria, but owned by an American, a New York foundation. And people in, uh, in Cotto Etrusco were so funny, and uh, I spent uh, some weeks with them, uh, eating a lot of truffle, <laughs> and, um, That's why they are funny. <laughs> yeah, even walking all around the country, if they they produce, uh, they used to produce terracotta and uh, and ceramic, but uh, I asked them uh, to bring me like in some kind of not archaeological site, but like places where people used to uh, to put like uh, materials from destroyed uh, or uh, heart quaking. And uh, that's uh, the place where I found some of the materials that I find again. Then uh, I made the creation and I fired again two or three times to make th three fire process of ceramics. So this is just one of the examples, but uh, normally I used to have fun. So for example, <laughs> <laughs> making art. So for example, in making like uh, the bees book, uh, these books uh, are made using uh, honeycombs. Of course, they are linked with the history I was telling about Yana's code, but they are mostly linked to the fact that uh, honey is uh, one of my favorite uh, food. And I would like to ask you something about the role of art, because w I had uh, a phone call with you at the beginning of September, and you told me, I'm doing a, a workshop about art therapy. You were working in, yeah. a, in a special place. So shall you share with us uh, your ideas about it and your experience about it? If so, possible. Yes, yeah, of it's course. <laughs> Just uh, near you is sitting, and that uh, I met uh, in uh, Dinamo Camp, Dinamo Camp is uh, like uh, a completely different world in which uh, some people used to share their life with children, uh, even with children that uh, are affected by autism uh, or some other problems. And uh, the idea is to make uh, dif life different, uh, to make life not just uh, an experience, uh, but uh, al almost happy life. 
and uh, I've been working along seven days with uh, eight between 80 and uh, 100 children and uh, I brought my experience uh, in this amazing show which is the Venice Biennale and I try to share it with the children and uh, with institutors or people that were working there the experience I made to make the piece for the Venice Biennale, but uh, I also showed them uh, how the result of the practice could be exhibited, could be transformed into an art piece. So I've been working with the guys, with the children, for to make two installations. One installation was uh, very similar to the iron sculpture laying up on the wall here in Venice, but it was much more bigger. It was 24 meters long, because I was working with hundred assistants. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one was like um, another step of this process. I made uh, using uh, three branches that uh, I found in nature just near one of the river that was flowing near the, the Dinamo camp and uh, using always wool wire and, uh, and other textile fragments uh, and uh, the installation is suspended up on the roof and um, it was another experience because working with children that uh, I've been working several years ago with children in, uh, in an area like a, a very problematic area near Catania called Librino to make uh, a giant uh, terracotta installation. And uh, this was my second time. And uh, this is also an answer to Luigi because, and, and to Simona, because working with those children, if those children have some other problems or trouble in their life uh, is like uh, sharing our joy and uh, it makes our life different. I think that Anna mm. saw that and uh, she can uh, testify that. And uh, so Dinamo Camp is, is, the, is the result of the engagement of several people and uh, the project uh, uh, was run by Paul Newman, the actor, mm -hmm. and there are several camps uh, all around the world right now, and uh, the art practice in the camp uh, is considered as one of the most important activity because children here can uh, can play or can uh, can do everything but uh, they have almost, so the most important thing is to socialize and to discover our way of, of expression. And uh, I think, uh, I have not been to the, the presentation of the work to the public, but in just one day they hosted 10,000 people visiting the show of the work we made. And they have uh, a very important program in which uh, I think every month uh, there's an artist working with children, make kind of workshop. But uh, and then after the workshop, uh, the works that have been done are normally on show in the Denema Museum, <laughs> and some of them could be sold to private collector to refund the foundation. Yeah, and uh, so thank you. Yeah, it was it was an, an incredible experience. Yes, I I had we had a this phone call yeah. and you weren't uh, really happy and then enthusiastic about the... Yeah, because the life, uh, as I told you before, life and art uh, are uh, two aspects uh, of the same thing. We cannot consider art outside real life uh, and uh, even the opposite. And uh, in this case, uh, the Dinamo Camp was, was like a perfect experience. Yeah. S mostly sharing heart with people yeah. that are normally not interested at all in art. Yes, and then it's the possibility of the universal language of the yeah. uh, of, of exactly. art. Exactly. I was trying to explain to the children how 
I discovered the science inside this kind of graffiti language that was carved inside the tombs, mm -hmm. in inside the Domus de Yanas. And children were much more interested, I think, that, than adults in, uh, in playing uh, this discussion or in trying uh, to make their own science using wool or using small sculpture with modern materials which was uh, the, the situation in which I felt myself lying inside the graves. And you use the signs uh, yes. in, in your artworks? During yeah, of the, course. The, yeah. Even here, yeah, even the, here. the one in Venice, uh, mm -hmm. the, the sculpture up on the wall, the, the iron sculpture up on the wall, is like uh, three uh, squared sh uh, school sheets. Mm -hmm in which uh, I made kind of languages using just uh, wool and uh, small sculpture with uh, modern materials. And uh, this is also like uh, an homage to this friend of mine, Butita. I told you that he mm -hmm. disappeared for, no, six months ago. And um, I discussed with him a lot about the importance of understanding the meaning of languages and the signs that uh, other people or other generation or even future de generation could give to, to the humanity. Uh, from code to the books, uh, I think you, you have one of the longest, uh, the longest, uh, I'm packing my library, uh, list of books uh, in, the <coughs> in the section of the exhibition. So, and I read that you have also uh, some uh, in very important um, parent uh, relation uh, yes, yeah. with uh, Grazia de Ledda. So, shall you <laughs> talk about the, yeah. the importance of book because it's the only the one media that we were uh, we, we didn't talk about the the writing uh, and the, the, the books. I just mentioned the the, co the topic and the most fundamental book in, in my life. But uh, even if uh, you said that uh, my list is one of the largest, yes, I, think. Yeah, I can make uh, like an infinite list <laughs> because <laughs> literature is uh, one of the most uh, gift we have received. And um, so for example, speaking of the, the work Yana's Code. All the literature along the 20th century in Sardinia, in which uh, some of relatives and parents, people from my family, devoted the entire activity, are, speaks about uh, this, the story of Domus de Yana's. Because, for example, I was, when I was living in Sicily, I met several uh, writers between uh, people that are still alive. Uh, I want to tell, uh, for example, Matteo Collura, but uh, some other people like um, Giuseppe Quatrillo or uh, Butita or Shasha, were people that uh, really enriched my life with their books uh, and without, also without discussion. So all the books uh, are like stones to make my life, but they are also stones to make my heart. One of the books I've been, uh, I've been choosing is Massa e Potere by Elias Canetti. Elias Canetti was... Uh, I've been studying up on this book when I was studying at the university. I've been uh, uh, even discussing and fighting with uh, my, the, the, my professor of sociology and uh, because I had a different interpretation of this book. And um, when I finished studying, I used the bo this book uh, to make uh, other works uh, and even my experience in Morocco 
was nailed by this book because at the same time that Elias Canetti was writing Masse Potere, he was writing another book, uh, The Voices of Marrakesh. And so this book uh, brought me in discovering another history and uh, I can tell the same for, uh, for, for each book. And uh, I think that uh, even making books uh, like some kind of fake mm. books between my hard works in uh, is part of is like uh, as the same way I was using fossils or fragments to be part of my of my works. Can you yeah? Can you use the microphone, please? Thank you. I don't know if I miss. No, it works. Oh, it's okay. So I just want to ask you why are you living in Paris? <laughs> because I was living in Basel and then I moved uh, one month ago to Rome and uh, considering the inspiration I feel, uh, okay, Basel is not uh, Paris of course, but uh, I feel more inspirated in uh, Italy than... Uh, mm. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> no, 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 but... Uh, I, my life uh, is, has been always like a gypsy life. I was telling before that uh, born in Sardinia and raised in Sicily, I was always dreaming to be in the other country. And uh, Paris is one of the most beautiful places where to live in the world. And uh, I've been living there for some months, uh, 16 years ago. And then, uh, seven years ago, for personal reason, I decided to move to Paris. And uh, I was so fortunate, I was so lucky, because I was telling that uh, even, the, even life, uh, almost life, uh, is the main source of inspiration for my work. And uh, my atelier in Paris is in the 11th district means uh, inside the Marais, in the border of the Marais, and uh, it's uh, in between two very, two places that uh, became very, very popular. But uh, not for a uh, good or lucky reason, because it's like uh, 300 meters far from Charlie Hebdo, mm -hmm and a couple of hundred meters from, from, from Bataclan. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this was tragic, but at the same time, the, this place gave me the possibility of understanding how our life uh, is going on right now, what's happening in the world. So, of course, uh, it was not a choice, like a proven choice, but I found myself in this place, and that uh, also thanks to Paris. Do we have here in Italy a lot of place for art or not? This, is the, this was the question. Yeah. Because most of the people have to go outside and then come back to have inspirations also. Okay. Y yes, uh, as I, I was saying before, I spent most part of my life in Sicily, which is like um, an open-air museum, the largest open-air museum worldwide. But uh, Italy is like that. Uh, I think uh, I'm so proud of, of my country, and I think it's the, the most beautiful place where to live for an artist. And I hope not just for an artist. <laughs> And uh, I know very well Italy because I've been traveling along, uh, along the peninsula and the islands uh, for all my life, and I still do that. Uh, and uh, it's my choice, for example, to make ceramic in Italy instead of making ceramic in Paris, because in my mind, uh, it makes no sense to make ceramic in Paris. Ceramic needs to be made made in Italy or, uh, for example, in North Africa, because this is part of, it, that, that belongs from there. Yeah. Matt, uh, 
you are from Sicily also, from, the, from Sardinia, and you prefer Umbria and not Sicily for ceramics? <laughs> 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 that, 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 that's uh, a good question, but uh, that's, uh, that's a good question, but uh, I was not explaining myself so well. <laughs> I've been making ceramic just to, to speak, if I speak about ceramic, in, in Siracusa, in Caltagirone, in Sciacca, in Burgio, in Palermo, in Trapani, everywhere in Sicily, because Sicily has not just one tradition of ceramic, has several traditions of ceramics. I've been collecting ceramic and ceramic fragments from uh, all the regions and from so different manufacturers. And uh, the latest ceramic I made in, in Umbria, because there was this factory, and because I was, I was living there for almost a month, 40 days, and also because I, was, I would like to experience their way to make ceramic, and because also those people were so, so nice and funny. But, uh, but Sicily, I, I think that Sicily is kind of volcano because even making ceramic in Sicily is an incredible experience because people know and they still live with ceramic. So the concept of ceramic is still alive. It's, it's very contemporary. In my opinion, ceramics come, come from south, not from north. And, uh, <laughs> and um, another question is related with uh, the, the before. Um, you have experience in Sardinia and in Sicily. What about Naples, that is middle way between the two big islands? Ceramic is not, uh, so first, ceramic is not just from the south. No. No, no, no. No, yeah, no, no. no. I, then I will answer. So, for example, I have some, I've been collecting some ceramic from Veneto and from, from Venice, which are so beautiful. And um, the tradition of Venetian ceramic was very, at certain time, was very close to Fainza's one and to Palermo's one which means that uh, between the 15th and the end of 16th century, even there were, the pl there were no planes and no trains, uh, between those cities all through the peninsula, people can communicate even through aesthetic. And uh, so that's just because of ceramic. And uh, excuse me. Uh, the, the point my, my question about is Naples. about Naples. Ah, Naples. Because okay, okay, uh, Naples. I, 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 I know that many French people love Naples. Love Naples. Many French? Yes, from Paris. Ah, okay. From Paris. Not only in the past. Yeah. Only now. Yeah, yeah. Only now. As Naples is considered a very good opinion in the, the um, strange uh, people from the north. Now. I can see. Uh, I can uh, see about Paris, because I have. Uh, I know people and I know friends. I, I, I know. I know friends from Paris that love the south of Italy generally, but uh, I almost know people that love Syracuse, Palermo, and Naples. And uh, no links between the three, but there's a, a very strong link between Palermo, where which is the city where I raised, and Naples. And uh, I love Naples. And uh, when I've been in Naples, I've been several times, I uh, always felt in Palermo, and uh, even the opposite. And uh, Naples is, is not just uh, an incredible city. It's funny. It's always alive. It's always on the move. And uh, it's... Uh, always mostly a surprise because being in Naples even uh, like uh, at the distance of some months uh, can completely change uh, the mind yeah 
And uh, all the time I've been in Naples, uh, I've been uh, changing my own mind because it makes me happy. Okay. Could I ask you, um, how do you see, how does your theater practice and your art practice come together? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, theater, theater was, I used to consider before this theater or uh, making uh, set design for theater as a side practice. But uh, since the beginning, uh, my idea was to make uh, scenography and sets uh, using my installation projects. So to transform those installations into sets for theater. The last one I made was very close to Venice. It was for Amedea. Mm, the, not the rip this one, but the Seneca's one. And uh, it was in one of the most beautiful theater worldwide, the, the Palladium Olympic Theater. And uh, in the set, uh, it, it, the, this set is so rich, the scenography of the theater designed by Palladio is so rich. So the only thing uh, I was, when I was reflecting uh, in how to make this set, uh, I decided, according to the, to the theater director, was to display beds, iron beds, from uh, a psychiat psychiatric criminal hospital from the 50s. I, I found the, the beds uh, in Sicily, in, um, where it's one of the main criminal hospital in Italy. And uh, this was, uh, this, that reminded me uh, an installation that I made uh, 10 years ago using beds from, uh, abandoned bed from uh, a destroyed hospital in, in Syracuse. So theater, to me, I, I love theater and mostly I love Greek <coughs> ancient theater. And of course, in uh, like in a contemporary interpretation, and uh, I think that uh, Greek tragedy is uh, always a key to understand uh, our daily mm -hmm. life. And uh, the town where I've been living for 18 years was Syracuse, which is the most important theater. Um, the Teatro Greco di Siracusa, and they host uh, every two years, uh, no, every year, before it was ev every two years, right now it's every year, the, the drama, kind of, of drama festival, reinterpreting every year ancient drama from the Greeks. Euripides is the star, of course, and uh, that gave me the possibility of uh, a continuous confrontation with the importance uh, and the actuality of Greek tragedy in theater. I don't know if uh, I will continue making a project for theaters, but I have to say that it's uh, really interesting and it's something that uh, can even s stimulate the mind of an artist in uh, acknowledging the space in uh, experiencing uh, some different materials. So, for example, when I was working to this media in, uh, in Vicenza, the old theater is made, is, is, is made in wood, so it's very fragile. And uh, so everything uh, needs to be made according to, like, uh, the fire protection proof. law. Yes, fireproof. Yeah, fireproof, of course. And uh, it, was, it was really hard, and it was completely different. So, for example, uh, from working to the Tindari Theater, which is an open-air mm -hmm. theater made by the Greeks. Uh, in, uh, in Tindari Theater, you have to, just to remind that the wind will be stronger than the, than the set. <laughs> so the wind can destroy the set in just one night. <laughs> so theater is like a, a great experience. 
And uh, even uh, as a spectator, theater is um, something that is so connected with the performing hearts. Living way and down, Casper are here. They are masters in doing that. <coughs> and uh, they probably can, uh, can understand me in how theaters, theater practice is, is central in, uh, in even in make every kind of art. Cinema is like a son of theater. There, is there a place anywhere in the world where do you like, would you like to, to be, to explore uh, the traditions and some, something like the research you did with Sardinia? Yeah, yes, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere in the world, but I have to say that my dream is to live uh, or to uh, spend the rest of my life uh, is a small island called Maretimo. And, uh, <laughs> and I want to explain that, I want to explain that. Because um, a friend of mine, uh, which uh, was directing uh, the, the theater of Syracuse for a long time, Justo Monaco, he disappeared years ago, told me that the real Ithaca was not uh, the Greek Ithaca, but was Maretimo. Mm -hmm. ah. So one of the books I choose for, uh, which are part of my choice, mm -hmm. is uh, the Odyssea. And uh, so I have to go to Maretimo. <laughs> not just to go, I've been to, I've been to Maretimo several times, but uh, Maretimo need to be the, my place. Your, your Ithaca. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well. I have some more questions, but I will do some more questions later. <laughs> okay. I ask, I can really thank you very much, Michele, and thank to all of you for being here. Thank you for the other artists, our curator, and uh, thank you again. <laughs>